as the waiting room empties and comes into the webinar, let me welcome you all uh, and to what is CG seminar number 161. And we must be close to the 40s in terms of our successive webinars. Uh, and today we have Richard Budd from Lancaster, who's going to talk to us about the infinite variety of the student experience. And we've just been discussing prior to coming onto, onto the webinar format itself, uh, how much variety there is in the, in the Zoom university experience that we're all having at the moment. Uh, and we do miss the place-based variety, which I think we'll, Richard will be discussing today. Um, before I introduce him properly, let me go to the webinar protocols. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So your words of wisdom will remain on the record for all time. Uh, if you, as long as YouTube lasts anyway. Uh, and uh, there's the uh, chat will also uh, go on the record and both will be posted within the next 48 hours or so. Um, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question, it makes it more personal for everyone. We recommend using the speaker view settings in Zoom so that you, you can more clearly see who is talking at any given time. To ask a question, use the chat function. Uh, type out your question there. And at the end of the speaker's main presentation, we'll then compose the Q&A on the basis of what people are raising in the chat. So the earlier you put your question down, the better, the more likely you are for it to enter into the subsequent discussion. When we come to that, um, when you're invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, the step we sometimes forget, uh, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. That's the end of the administration. Um, let me introduce Richard Budd. Now, Richard's a, a lecturer at Lancaster um, in higher education in the Department of Educational Research which is headed by uh, Paul Ashwin, who's the Deputy Director of CG and is a notable and regular presenter in our webinar program. Richard's research interests revolve around notions of higher education as a sector, uh, how organizations in the sector operate and how they compare with each other. So very interesting, the field of higher education, its differentiations, its similarities, um, and how students experience and negotiate these different kinds of university experience. Richard, over to you. Okay, Simon, great. Thanks very much. Uh, share screen, share screen. Hopefully, not the leave button, the share button. Okay, um, Simon, we're, can you put thumbs we're up? We're rolling, yeah, that, all is well. Okay, great. So um, to get going, um, I have to sex up the original title a bit. Um, Simon was put me under a certain amount of pressure to kind of make it a bit more catchy and interesting. So, I mean, I'll come back to where the title fits into all of this again at the end. But this is a project I finished um, about three or four months ago. It was an SRHE funded uh, project looking at um, the student experience across some fairly new uh, or some hopefully fairly novel dimensions as well as some old ones. Um, so, next slide, yeah. So in terms of thinking about the student experience, the question, is, I kind of took a step back and I said, well, what is it that we know about the student experience? And then thinking about where the gaps might be. Um, and to start off, one of the things I'm not looking at is the student experience in terms of what is marketed by universities. One of the things that we're seeing at the moment, um, particularly um, under the sort of pandemic conditions, the students are getting less face-to-face -face teaching and less campus experience or a different campus experience, depending on, on kind of who and where they are, is there's this discussion around um, refunds because they're not getting the experience. And of course, this is part of the, the discussion that you know, what is it that universities are selling? And is it a tuition fee? Is it a student fee? Is it something else? My main interest in terms of the student experience is, is the broader kind of human slash sociological element. Um, I'm not exactly looking at teaching and learning, not in terms of what is being taught and learned, but I'm looking at it, I'm looking at teaching as part of the experience of being at university. And if you look at the literature across the student experience, we know that where you study matters. Um, at one level, um, and which connects to the kind of 
the slightly nonsense approach of the value for money argument that the government's pushing around potentially variable fees and those kinds of things is that the university you study at um, has probable implications for your employment trajectory and income as you know as does your um, particularly around your social background and those kinds of things but what we also know is that where you study in terms of country is fundamentally important in that um, the arrangements around fees and university cultures vary um, greatly or lesserly depending on where you are um, as well as within countries and therefore how you kind of talk about students or how students are then framed within that um, is also very variable whether or not they're partners whether or not they are customers whether or not they are apprentices um, whether or not they're policy pawns um, and those kinds of things sorry that should be tight not tie um, misnaming a professor in my own department is not a good look um, we also know that the social composition of the university is really important kind of most of the ex most of the literature around the student experience focuses on questions of identity particularly for minority groups within universities so um, particularly if you are a working class student in an elite university you're likely to be in a minority and that can make it a very uncomfortable space for various reasons i'll come back to that literature in a little bit we also know that the institutional profile to some extent makes a difference in that the history and status of a university um, has some bearing um, on its orientations towards teaching and research and that paper by um, by Vicky Bolivar and colleagues um, pointed out the fact that high status universities one of the reasons why they um, like to recruit high attaining individuals is because they can potentially teach them less which frees up more space for research this is something I'll come back to so in a way we know that where you study matters and the question is, is in a way what don't we know and if you look across the student experience literature, um, for various reasons, there's kind of a, an, an implicit assumption that if you study at certain kinds of universities, your experience at those will be the same. So if you went to Oxford and Cambridge, your experience is kind of the same. If you study at a research intensive university, because the student composition is relatively similar between Bristol or Newcastle or whoever, that your experience will be kind of the same um, because you will be in relation to the student body um, in a majority or minority and the orientation towards teaching and research will be in a certain way so what i wanted to do was dig into that in a bit more depth to think okay if you went to Birmingham and you went to bristol which on paper are by and large very similar institutions um, or you know two former polytechnics let's say john moores and manchester met or um, two plate glass universities like um, Lancaster and Bath, for example, on paper, kind of similar. But the question is, how do we dig within that to try and understand how the student experience might be different within them? So this is when the project comes in, in terms of thinking about the role of the university in mediating the students' experiences. And Simon and I were talking just now a little bit about the fact that universities smell different, they feel different. You know, you walk onto a campus and there's something in the air, you know, students go on, go to um, open days and students I've spoken to say that I just felt that I belonged there. There's a, there's a certain kind of, there's an atmosphere in a university and that depends on who you are, the character of the university, what you think a university is supposed to look like, whether your idea of a university is sort of um, old and cloistered and wood panelled or something else. And also, um, the way that universities are laid out, you know, you walk, you walk around Oxford as, as a campus slash city or city campus, however you'd want to call it, and it feels very different if you're walking onto a campus based university like Lancaster, which is out of town. So what I started to do was to think about how the social composition of the, of the university matters. You know, this is obviously fairly well trodden ground in some ways, but then also looking at the organizational culture, if we can, and also the geography of the campus. So, um, it's probably worth, um, I mean, in a way it's fairly obvious that if you try to um, collect data from student participants in a four month period, which um, consists of two periods of industrial action, um, a Christmas break and is bookended by a pandemic, things are not gonna go according to plan. Um, they didn't. Um, I was originally planning to um, collect data at two different universities, but in a way, you can only knock on so many doors and when it doesn't when it stops working you just have to kind of give up and go with what you've got 
So instead of looking at two universities neighboring each other, which I'll come back to at the end, um, I recruited um, a lot less students than I planned for focus groups at a high status Northern University. Um, it's a member of the Russell group, it's research intensive, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It's one of those, right? Um, and then my student demographics were mostly female, mostly in the social sciences, kind of an equal split between undergrad and postgrad, um, and ranging in their age from 18 to 35, um, and relatively varied in terms of their, of their kind of background dimensions. So um, it's breadth and not generalizability, and also, but then depth within, uh, within the focus groups. And the focus groups um, were anywhere between five people and one person, which of course becomes an interview, but um, same set of questions. So really what I'd like to spend most of today talking about is the findings and then asking you some questions about how I take this further potentially. I've got some ideas, but I'd like to kind of hold it out to the floor to see what people can suggest. So um, the analysis um, was, I did thematic analysis partly because I've been unable to find a theoretical perspective that kind of helps me contain these three dimensions. There are some theoretical approaches that consider organizational culture and social composition, but not geography, or they consider social composition and geography, but not necessarily organizational culture. So I've been kind of, I'm, I'm still hunting for something that works for me. Um, so kind of stepping straight into it, the literature around organizational culture as a phenomenon or as an idea kind of points out that um, the organizational culture is not just made up by what the leaders say, this is our culture, these are our values. It's actually um, much more kind of um, an agglomeration of lots of different people's ways of thinking and operating. So if you have a university which has particular ways of operating and you swapped all of the people out, the culture is going to change. There'll be something about that university which is still there, but there, there's also going to be a massive change and the, the culture is not independent of the people within it. And also the notion that you have subcultures within organizations too. And of course, the bigger the organization, the more potential subcultures you have. If you look in business, there's sort of an ongoing um, discussion between the different subcultures, between what the marketers are trying to do, what the engineers are trying to do, um, and what the management is trying to do, and how those things then pull together. And in a way, there's not that much work looking at organizational culture in higher education that I've been able to find. I mean, Ian McNai's work from 95 was kind of, seems to be one of the ones that the few people who've talked about this um, talk about um, or reference. And in the same way that when we talk about higher education sectors as being kind of uh, representations of competing visions in a way, whether it's the marketized university, the Humboldtian university, um, the bureaucratic university, the same way that within universities you have those competing tensions. Um, and so you're going, and these things all play off against each other. And of course, the question is, is which ones are winning um, or which ones come through strongest? And we know, um, so Gwen van der Velden's work looked at the way that universities orient themselves towards their students. There's a lot of discussion around the notion of student as customer. Um, and there's, there are also ways of unpacking this and how universities actually relate to their students and then interact with their students and frame their students can be different depending on where you go. Um, and again, I mentioned this before, but um, universities can be more or less interested in their teaching and widening participation for various reasons. So we know that um, we have a sense that organizational culture is going to be complex and diverse. Um, and then looking at it from the students' perspectives, um, what was interesting is that notion of subcultures came through quite strongly and in a way not necessarily competing but there are sort of various orientations within the university so by and large they felt the organization was very passionate and socially engaged thinking was very future oriented trying to make the world a better place um, and at the same time being very traditional particularly with lots of old ways of working um, some old buildings and those kinds of things but also quite modern so but then with modern buildings and with a very kind of up-to-date kind of forward thinking um, sort of cutting edge orientation. Um, seen as in some ways very hierarchical, particularly sort of um, in layers within certain academic staff or within the organization um, and students kind of at the bottom of that, but also at the same time people talked about it being very, very egalitarian in some ways. 
Um, and this varied depending on the department, this very dependent on whether or not they were talking about a particular faculty and these kinds of things. But we have all of these things playing off at the same time. They saw the university on the one hand as being very profit oriented, and this came through, um, I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, little bit later on, but then also very socially oriented. And these things were both operating in the same place. Um, it's a very supportive place to be a student, but also a place where as a student, you could be neglected. So we had um, kind of horror stories and also very heartwarming stories, um, you know, kind of across the piece. What was pretty much unanimous was that the university was very focused on research. And this was kind of its primary objective was to be a research institution. And then teaching played second fiddle to that. And to some extent, um, there was a lot of um, discussion around the ways that um, the university was committed to teaching, but actually research was kind of, was, was always the greater weight there. And so then there were some people who really were not committed to teaching at all. And then some people who were very committed to teaching, but were also pulled away from it, um, from what they were able to do in terms of research commitments and those kinds of things. Then if we move on to the pedagogy, um, there was a huge variation in the way that teaching was done. And by and large, people thought the teaching was great, um, very engaging, very supportive, um, and also encouraging students to be independent learners. Um, and the academics were friendly and approachable, but some were also then very distant at the same time, or not at the same time, but within the same organization. Um, there was a recognition that a lot of the teaching was delivered by precarious staff, um, and students were really quite worried about the fact that a lot of their staff were struggling to live. Um, and this comes through in the strikes, we'll come back to as a, in a little bit. And even though um, the students were there primarily for their learning, they they would still recognize that research was kind of the key emphasis of the university. They also saw that the, um, the organizational culture of the university was very, much, um, was very geared towards the notion of Russell University as a high status institution. And the way they talked about high status came through in three different ways. The first was in kind of um, tangible slash, slash measurable stuff. Um, you know, that we see in university rankings and so on. So university ranking status, also the fact that you needed to have high grades to get in, the fact that it was a relatively wealthy university and had a lot of different resources. It spent a lot of money on certain things. It was a big institution. And some of the students talked about the fact that it had very high volumes of citation and those kinds of things. So those were the measurables. There was also a lot of things that they talked about um, that they knew were just um, just perceptions. So um, the fact that it was a famous institution um, and reputable was something that came out. They went, I know it's a, it's a well-known university. You know, the fact that I've come here from another country because it's well-known, I wouldn't have gone to another university down the road or in another city because no one's ever heard of it there. Um, also, they saw the fact that there were a lot of different disciplines within the university as also a marker of its status. As in this is part of their idea of what a university is or what a good uni is, is one that has a very broad disciplinary base. Um, and its membership as a, as a Russell Group um, institution. And it was kind of intriguing that a lot of the students recognized that the Russell Group in itself didn't mean anything, but it had a certain amount of um, kudos and status that went with it. Um, so that was the kind of the perception stuff. But then also there was an interesting and slightly troubling um, notion of superiority where, for example, there's a, a like a level of discourse across the student body and also, for example, a university Facebook group about the Polytechnic University, which was fairly nearby um, as being there a bit thick. And that's where you go if you don't get the grades. And there's this kind of um, this discourse of superiority over a neighboring university, which was um, yeah, pretty worrying um, in a sense, well, in many senses. And on the outside of this, in terms of sitting what sits beyond the university, um, the, the fact that I was collecting data around the strikes meant that the strikes, it wasn't something I'd planned. I didn't, obviously didn't know they were going to happen a year in advance, but um, the strikes highlighted something really interesting, which was that they, they, the students noticed a real divide between what the university as an organization wants in terms of its management, but also what the academics were trying to do. And I'll come to this in, in the next section. Um, but the students were very sympathetic with, with the staff. Um, they 
certainly bemoaned the fact that they were losing, particularly for master's students, they were losing weeks and weeks of teaching. And for international students who paid, I don't know, 20,000 pounds a year to be losing a month's worth of teaching really hits hard because you're only there for a certain length of time, particularly if the third term is taken up with your research project. Um, and there were also policy issues around international recruitment. So um, there are, in the same way that most other universities of its type, about a third of the students are international. Well, one of the things that came through quite a lot is that um, the university was fairly indiscriminatory in terms of its recruitment. So there were some courses that were essentially almost all international students. And so the international students found this to be a real problem because they wanted to meet domestic students and they couldn't because there weren't any in their, in their groups. Um, and then also for the, um, this then created uh, questions um, or tensions within the student body, which I'll come to in a little bit. So you can kind of see that the um, sort of the position of the university and the sort of the policy context feeds in to what the university does and how it operates and what the, the problems and their perceptions of the organization. So that's organizational culture. The last thing that I, um, not the, sorry, the second thing I'm talking about is the notion of, of the social composition. And this is fairly well-trodden ground, particularly around questions of social class, around gender, to a certain extent around international students. Um, we know that there are potentially tensions in the way that um, if you're in a minority group, you're going to feel potentially quite uncomfortable on a university campus. There's less work around ethnicity and race, sexual identity and orientation and disability. Um, but again, um, being in a minority can be an uncomfortable um, experience for lots of students. So what's slightly different about this study is that I wasn't necessarily looking at targeting social groups and then look, thinking about how they felt in relation to the student body. I was kind of looking to talk to as many different people as possible and look at how they describe the student body more broadly. And kind of across, across the piece, there was this sort of recognition that the, the student body was by and large fairly young, fairly white, fairly affluent, quite socially progressive in its views. Um, people worked hard, it was fairly left leaning and people were intelligent slash high attaining. So this is kind of how they viewed the student body as a whole. And in many ways, they saw the student body as fairly diverse and inclusive. So particularly a wide variety of people with different interests, um, in terms of gender, there weren't considered to be um, many, any serious problems. Um, in terms of uh, variation in accents, that was seen to be just part of um, diversity. And also um, students, um, international and domestic, remarked on the fact that it was a fairly LGBTQI plus place to be. And there didn't seem to be many great tensions there. But in the same time as being diverse and inclusive, it was also very divided. And some of the students talked about what they called invisible barriers between groups. Um, some of these came through in terms of social class and wealth. In that, um, students who were very wealthy and upper class um, potentially clashed with students who weren't. And those students who were working class or less wealthy felt very excluded and kind of um, and not recognized in a sense that some people didn't realize they couldn't just go and spend a hundred pounds on a night out and that kind of stuff. Um, as a young university for mature students, it, it, it can be pretty um, a fairly lonely place I spoke to um, one local British student who was in her 30s, who was on a course where she was the only British student on the course and everyone else was younger and international. Um, personal politics came up a lot. Um, so there were certain political tensions between people that had um, differing political voting views. Um, there were also divides between disciplines. So it was quite difficult to meet people outside your own faculty or outside your own discipline. And the campus played a role in this, as I'll come to. Questions around language and race, particularly for international students, they felt very separated in some ways. They saw the academic staff. I mean, there's a literature on the way that, um, that higher education is, is, fairly, um, is fairly white and middle class. And again, um, very white British or Western, politically fairly left leading, which will have Toby Young up in arms, I'm sure. Um, but very approachable, um, not very hierarchical, particularly a lot of the international students said that the, the idea that you can call academics by their first names is just, is just mystifying to them. The fact that there was less of a kind of a power dynamic, um, not no power dynamic, but less of, and fairly student oriented. But they noticed, and this came through their, their discussions of the strikes, that there was a real difference in between 
what the management saw the university as being and how they wanted it to run and what the academics wanted to do and how they wanted it run. So they saw the management as, as invisible, um, essentially oriented around um, managerial goals rather than um, student learning conditions and academic working conditions. And there was a talk about a lot of kind of things being swept under the carpet in the, names, in the name of the institutional reputation rather than actually being dealt with um, and solved. And within this, um, there were bridges and barriers between the groups. So um, there were certain sort of um, activities or functions within the university that allowed those diverse groups to interact. So student societies and sports came up quite a lot and so did accommodation and social spaces and small group teaching. But those, these didn't always work and that sometimes those, um, let's say class divides or language and race divides, even within social spaces and social groups, still um, didn't allow this bridging to take place. So if you have international students going to the student union and going to some kind of club, and then they find it very difficult to get involved in the conversation and they don't kind of get invited in among other things. Um, there are also major barriers to the ways that, um, to, to people interacting. So lectures were kind of on the opposite side of, of seminars. So the fact that people sit within their groups, within their national groups, um, within lecture theatres and then don't talk to each other meant that this hindered interaction and people meeting, meeting each other um, and also staff workloads. Um, this meant that because staff was seen as being very overworked, they had less time to dedicate, dedicate to students. And if most of their teaching was done in lectures, then they didn't have much way of interacting with students because of course a lecture is largely one way. So the social composition was kind of diverse and divided at the same time. Um, the last area, and this is another area where there's surprising little research, um, as a pop quiz question, um, how many universities can you think of in the UK which aren't named after the place they're located in? Um, and by and large, universities are anchored to place um, and they, to some extent, grouped by their architecture. So in the UK, we have the red brick universities in Australia, you have the sandstone universities. Um, we also have the plate glass and the Ivy League. So to some extent, architecture is a feature of, of what universities are and place is important. And um, I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of literature that looks at the architecture of universities. And particularly if you have an older university, if they build something new every 10 years, they build something which is new and cutting edge every 10 years. So when we're in a campus that has a hundred different buildings, we'll tell a lot of different architectural stories. Um, campus buildings or university buildings sometimes work and sometimes don't. Um, also, there's a, a certain amount of literature around the way that um, university campus or university campuses are used to project something. So if you look at university prospectus, which buildings is, is it that they show? Even very new universities use their old buildings on the front of the prospectus and those kinds of things. Um, there's a certain amount of work from architecture that looks at the flows on campuses. So for example, where do people go? And then where do people potentially not cross over? Are there kind of collegial or shared spaces or are students kind of corralled away from each other? And then there's also the discussion of town and gown, which is the ways in which the university kind of um, is situated within the city and the way it interacts with the city. That's very different to somewhere like Oxford, where if you took the university out, the city would look completely different. Whereas at Lancaster, if you took the city, if you took the university out, you wouldn't notice it so obviously, um, in, you know, in a, in a material sense, because it's outside the city. So when it comes down to um, how the students talked about the campus and its geographies, um, one of the things that came up a lot was that location is key. Location, location, location. So the fact that the university is in a major city in the UK was definitely a draw card. So people wanted to be in a city where there are a lot of different things to do, places to get part-time jobs. They wanted to be in somewhere that was busy and, and diverse. Um, the UK in terms of its global status and its well-known university system was also seen as a draw. Um, you know, if you went to a, a major city in a different country, it doesn't have the same kind of attraction. Um, it's kind of similar in terms of its diversity and bustling and recreation, but it's not UK based, so, you know, brand UK. Um, and within the UK, one of the things that came up a lot is that, that this city in the north of England is warmer than Scotland and cheaper than London. So you kind of, you know, they wanted the kind of the London lifestyle in a way, but they didn't want to pay 
London premium for that. So the location is key in terms of bringing students to wherever they are. Um, it's also worth pointing out that universities are really unusual. I was trying to think of um, other similar kinds of organizations that contain the same variety of activities, um, maybe prisons, right? So teaching and research, study, living, socializing, eating, shopping and sports, um, activism, mental health support and entertainment, all of these things happen on campuses. They're pretty unusual as organizations um, in this sense. And by and large, students thought that there was a lot going on and the university was able to support a huge range of activities. There were also questions though around the fact that a lot of services were overpriced, particularly catering. That at some times, particularly peak times, study spaces were limited. And also there was um, a sense that the, um, that the campus was also divided along disciplinary lines. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. Um, architecture, of course, is one of those things that we have like a visceral response to. And um, people found it, people loved it and they hated it. They found that it complicated and confusing. They found it compact and self-contained and easy to navigate. You know, all of this stuff, beautiful and ugly. Um, and this notion of the fact that it was divided by disciplines meant that if you were, let's say, a social sciences student and all of your social sciences stuff was located in one part of the campus, they would have almost have nothing to do with medical students who were all located in another building. So actually what happens is the campus contains and divides groups. So it's part of this division mechanism in a sense. And then there are some buildings that are only accessible to students in that faculty. So again, this is another way that students are corralled away from each other that kind of um, disables or hinders interaction between different kinds of students to a certain extent. And the campus was also seen as diverse in terms of, it tells a long architectural history. You know, the university is over a hundred years old and it has a diversity of buildings, stuff from, um, from the very new to the 1950s to Victorian and so on and so forth. So there's a massive variety in there. And what was interesting is the face of the university was a particular building that none of the students ever went into. So even though it's the image of the university and it's traditional, it's high status, and it's very British, it was not something that students, not anywhere that the students ever went. So it's, it has purely a symbolic value, um, which in a way was kind of interesting. And there was also a, a focus or something that came through a lot was that the kind of the recognition that the university pumps a lot of money into certain disciplines, not into others. So within the arts and humanities and social sciences, the buildings were kind of um, were, were a bit tatty. Whereas if you went into some other disciplines, everything was super shiny new. Um, and so this was again kind of a reflection of the organizational culture and where their priorities were. Um, so kind of wrapping this up, I realize I've covered a lot of ground. In a way, um, the project was sort of a success and that what I wanted to do was try and capture the sense of how, um, what a university culture looks like to students. And I was able to do that to a certain extent. Um, I was also able to continue to look at the, student, the notion of the student identity and its position within the student body um, in a slightly different way um, that's been done before. It didn't necessarily tell us that much new, I don't think, um, but I just came at it from a different angle. Um, but then that notion of your, your positionality within the student body as a majority or minority and which groups you're a member of or none, in a sense, um, is important. One of the other things was thinking about the way the campus works. Um, what was a massive loss was the fact that I wasn't able to do this study at two different universities. Um, the comparative element of that would have been really, really useful in just to see, in a sense, how they came out. So in a way, um, the, the bigger questions for me, I'll do comparative utility first. So a lot of what I've said here, in a way, you could probably transfer, give or take, to most other similar universities of its type. So in a way, I've kind of dug deeper and found sort of what we might expect to find. Um, the question is, is, if I did the same thing in two very similar universities, whether or not I'd be able to discern something fundamentally different between, let's say, um, Oxford and Cambridge, for example, sort of the same, but sort of not. As anyone who's worked or studied in those two universities will know, they smell the same, but they feel different, right? To a certain extent, it's still wood paneling. Um, but again, it, it's, it's not exactly the same. Um, so the question is, one of my questions is, how do, I, how do I work out whether or not I can develop this further to 
meaningfully discern the differences between different kinds of universities or similar kinds of universities. I think the stuff around campus geographies and organizational culture and social composition, if I went to a teaching oriented university, let's say a polytechnic or a much newer university, I'd probably come across quite different stuff in terms of the way the university is laid out. It wouldn't be so big, it wouldn't be so diverse. It wouldn't have as many international students and those kinds of things. There'd be more teaching. So that tells you something. Um, and of course, I mentioned this earlier, and just as I wrap up really quickly, that I've really struggled to find a theoretical approach that helps me unpack this, that helps me bring in all of those dimensions at the same time. You know, I can go to organizational theories and that's kind of useful up to a point. I can go and look, I can look in geography of place and space and that's kind of useful up to a point. Um, and I can look at um, sort of sociological theories and that's kind of useful up to a point, but I can't find something which joins them all together necessarily. When the so what question is where we come back to the title in the sense that what this hopefully pulls out is the fact that there are lots and lots of different ways that we can explore how universities are constituted in terms of their social composition, which is never the same anywhere. It can be similar, but it won't be the same. Its layout will not, will not be the same in the fact that campuses are not identical. Um, and also in the sense that organizational cultures, even between fairly similar universities, in some senses can't be the same because they have different people and different histories, even if those people and histories are relatively similar. So in a way, the student experience is not something you can generalize about very much um, beyond a very broad level. So um, coming back to the title, the student experience is infinitely variable because universities are all very different and who you are within that university therefore shapes how you experience the end. Well done, Richard. That was quite a presentation. It took us through a lot of issues and elements in the institution we call the university. And uh, I mean, I think what your presentation does for me, and it's clearly a work in progress, like you don't have a sort of final category system or theorization here, uh, but, but you're sort of pointing towards something more um, definitive though. I think you're looking for that and you're moving in that direction. I think what this, this has showed me is something I thought for a long time that you cannot understand the university as a social institution or organization through the lens of the other well-established uh, frameworks we have for understanding organizations. And then the corporation, the firm is one that's very important in Western social science. There's also um, analogies with government and there's analogies with armies, uh, but none of those are going to work here. The university is different, too different to those other organizations to fit. Um, I was struck by your point about the variety of experience in universities being greater than it is in other organizations and the variety of activity rather, and perhaps experience also. But, um, uh, and you mentioned prisons, I think is possibly a kind of analogy. Uh, but it, it, I think probably you, you'd need to look at the, the urban environment, the city, the city as a sort of site or social organisation to capture that full diversity, which you've quite rightly uh, drawn attention to. Um, so I think your, your search for primary categories for differentiation is absolutely the right way to go, but you will need a unifying a picture, a narrative or theorisation, which uh, which I think will, 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 you know, will, will be different in the case of universities. I've got a question, I've got several questions, but I'll just ask one now. Um, looking at the, I want to go from the question of diversity between universities to the question of the internal life of the university, which you also explain as highly diverse. Um, you point to the different disciplines, the different kinds of individual student experience. I mean, all these aspects which make the university multiple in its character. Um, and this is the Clark Kerr point, you know, very incisive, you know, pre, sort of postmodernism point before we had postmodernism, Clark Kerr's point about the, the multiplicity and the way in which the, this organization holds together so many different disciplines, ways of seeing identities, groups, stakeholders, social purposes, and so on, how all these things are combined. So the big question for me is what holds it together? Why does it function successfully? What enables a university to be a coherent organization? Do you have an answer for that? 
if you don't have an answer for that, I certainly don't have an answer for that. Yeah, I mean, I think again, you know, the, if you think about the notion of um, kind of the broader idea of the university, I think that's probably what holds it together in that there is by and large a kind of an orientation towards certain kinds of goals around the production dissemination of knowledge and a particular position in society. And that's kind of what holds it together. And across the disciplines, they're all doing that, but potentially with different means and ends in mind. Um, and then you have questions of politics and epistemology um, within that. But I guess it's that broader mission of, um, well, all the three missions, let's say, plus any others that you might want to add to that, that probably holds it all together. Um, in terms of its diversity, but then also allows a certain allows that diversity, but there are also conforming pressures at the same time, as you know, as you've written about yourself. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm uncertain about this. I mean, I think though that um, I mean, you're right about the knowledge related aspect being what distinguishes the university from other social organisations, um, not just teaching and learning, but research and everything else. It's what the university brings to gives to society, which isn't accessible in the same way anywhere else whereas uh, almost everything else the university does is replicated somewhere else the knowledge um intensity of it uh, does seem to be distinctive yeah um, if i can just say one other thing that um just in a response to something that you've mentioned i have looked at a certain amount of work around urban studies and there's some really interesting stuff in there um and i guess in a way that i'm kind of leaning towards what might what we might call a comparative anthropology of higher education because to get that level of understanding of how the place works, you need to spend a lot of time in there. One of the things that was interesting in my interviews is from other studies I've done, this was quite different. And it wasn't an anthropology, but I was certainly getting a sense of what the, what the university looked like from the inside out, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the other thing I think that I would point to is, um, is the importance of the university's role in, in uh, determining and allocating status to individuals and to groups. Uh, I think that yeah. status function is quite important, a social allocation function, um, and that it gives it gives status to people who even who don't earn much in the labour market, which is one of the reasons why low income earning graduates are quite you know quite and don't trigger a sort of withdrawal from higher education. That in itself is not sufficient, the, the earnings are not sufficient to capture the role of higher education. There's the status allocation function is important. And also universities acquire status and, uh, and, and reproduce status as institutions. It's a longer discussion, but um, I find that fairly more persuasive than arguments about their role in the knowledge economy, for example, which I think is much more flaky um, analytically. Now yep. we better move into the discussion because there's a number of people who've got good ideas in the chat. So can I bring in, Andrea Detmer, and we'll follow Andrea by Yelena Brankovic. Andrea. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, thank you, Richard. That was super interesting. I want to ask you about a tension that I observe between this diversity in universities and what I conceive very standardized practices of evaluation and assessment. So in a way, you have shown us like a big variety of, uh, well, of areas in which universities are different. And I think there's an, an explicit kind of recognition of this in academia, of this diversity of universities and also of the students' learning experiences, not only experience in general. <laughs> but it seems to me that evaluation of students' uh, learning outcomes and also of institutions, for example, for accreditation or for funding purposes, they seem to be quite standardized. And moreover, I think I may be wrong on this and it may vary uh, from country to country, but at least in the UK, I have the feeling that if there were some standards for research and in the last 10, let's say 10 or 15 years, it has moved towards more standards in teaching and standards in dissemination or the third mission, if you want. So there seems to be like some tendency also in more standards. So how do we deal with this diversity versus standardized uh, practices? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, that's partly a teaching and learning focus, which is, um, not the kind of angle I've gone down, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot about the kind of um, about convergence within higher education and the ways and the degree of agency slash structure around that um, in the sense that um, I suppose the tension in the UK is that universities are being kind of given more autonomy slash responsibility for their own survival. But at the same time, there is a greater level of kind of third party control over what it is that they do 
um, through external agencies. Um, and in terms of evaluation and assessment, um, I mean, it's outside the scope of this because it, again, it goes into teaching and learning. I was more interested in the ways that teaching and learning does or doesn't inhibit interaction between different kinds of people. Um, I mean, if we think that, if we think as an idea that the university is a space for diverse people to kind of bump against each other and learn from each other, this is something which, the, which this university, at least at the moment, is not fostering. So the fact that you even put a whole lot of diverse people in a room doesn't mean they're going to speak to each other. Um, doesn't mean that they're going to learn from each other. So one of the things that kind of stood out was that a lot of the um, a lot of the domestic students would say things like, the international students don't really want to hang out with us. And the international students would be saying things like, it's really frustrating, the English students don't want to talk to us. Um, so you kind of get stuck in between these two, you know, well, these endless amounts of tensions. Um, so yeah, but it's difficult because you're being pulled and pushed in different directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. That kind of answers your question. Thanks, Richard, and thanks, thanks, Andrea. Um, Jelena, Jelena Benkovic. Hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you, Richard, very much for um, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I actually wanted to ask you something about uh, your notion of invisible boundaries uh, and bridges across them. Um, and I was wondering, uh, in your data, when you, when you talk to students, you know, how perceptive or how reflexive or students of these, you know, boundaries or bridges, you know, was there any awareness of these divisions to be an issue or maybe something they, um, they could overcome or was it more something that was just tacit and a non-issue? Well, itself? actually, no, well, it, no, it was both in the sense that, because um, I asked about it directly. <laughs> One of the questions I asked was kind of how inclusive do you feel the university is? And by and large, and they started talking about the fact that, you know, particularly, for some students um, who came from elsewhere where LGBTQI plus issues were, were kind of not talked about. And the fact that this was kind of an open and accessible thing um, was really good. So they saw it very inclusive in that sense. Um, but also I asked about um, whether or not, you know, would you say that the university is a space where all different kinds of people can mix with everybody else? And they went, no. And this notion of invisible boundaries, it's, you know, you have those, um, those moments sometimes in an interview where a student says something and you go, there's the topic for that paper. Well, one of the students said, it's really weird. It feels like there's an invisible boundary between the domestic students and the international students. And as soon as that light went off, I started seeing it everywhere. Um, I mean, part of that was because I was asking about it because I was asking about inclusion and diversity. Because if the idea for international students is that they come to the UK and they meet lots of domestic students, it seems that a lot of them don't. So the ones that had really good experiences of this were where they were undergraduate students in a minority on their course. Whereas for postgraduate students, if you're in a cohort of, of 100 students on a course and 98 of them are Chinese, and there are, there are difficulties and you're in student only, in Chinese only accommodation or international student only accommodation, your ability in a year for a master's degree to actually find different people and meet them is quite difficult. And even if, if you do try and cross those bridges, they can go into student societies and they kind of like, they're unsure of themselves, they're not quite so forward necessarily, and they kind of ask a question, they get kind of shut off or, or whatever. So, um, I mean, it was, it was absolutely explicit as well as implicit across the piece. Mm. In a way for me, it's kind of the headline thing in that, Studies before I mentioned this have looked quite often at the experiences of particular groups. And so there's a whole lot of research around the way that international students may be unintegrated or kind of uh, excluded in some ways. But it was interesting to see the way that that panned out across different dimensions that everybody talked about it. You know, international student or the student body was divided into four groups. The white Western, um, the international East Asian, the international African and the international Middle Eastern with kind of um, particularly around certain social events that do or don't allow that kind of thing. You know, if the UK experience is, is very kind of um, alcohol oriented, if you're not alcohol oriented, it's entirely, you know, you can't get in that way. So it's difficult. So yeah, um, implicit and explicit at the same time. My own um, research with international students in Australia and New Zealand showed that um, the, um, uh, the, there were very real barriers between local students and, and international students as groups. Uh, local students fairly indifferent to the need to make friends with international students and international students struggled 
to yep. overcome that. Um, but there was a great deal of diverse experience of, of, of cross-cultural friendship within the international student group itself. So what people found was that they'd come to the country of English speaking country of education. They, as you say, face barriers like the fact that people drank as a social means and they didn't and so on. Uh, and for one reason or another, they didn't make the friends they were going to make locally and learn all about their culture, but they had this unexpected um, delight of, of making really good close personal friends with people from other other international destinations and often uh while there were barriers between middle east africa and asia asia is a very big category so there was you know a great deal of interaction between south asia southeast asia east asia very different worlds all of them um so you know it's not it's not all black uh if people no, are making no, friends with not. international students um, um usually they're usually they're doing something else as well uh, very big um, same culture groups sometimes do create a barrier because it's too easy, isn't it, to just stay with your friends? But uh... one of the things, yeah, on, on those lines, one of the things that, that kind of was really interesting was that a lot of the Chinese students who I spoke to said that they'd never get the opportunity to meet students from different parts of China. That's right. There you are, so more diversity. UK and, you know, they're all trying out different cuisines from all across China because, of course, China in itself is very diverse. So. It is. Now, I've got some questions to come and we've got one from Kyung Mi Lee who's outside at the moment and wants me to ask the question on his behalf and I think he's from Lancaster uh, so you you she, know him um she, she yes ah that's what that's the anonymity of uh, of of the, of the chat you can't always tell who's who's what um what will be the core implications of your study findings for universities and academics what shall we do differently to help students and support their experiences? How can we move from the heterogeneity of student experiences to a shared aim purpose of university education? I think the core implication, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about, and this leads on from, from Yelena's question as well, is that um, if we think that the universities are that the university experience is supposed to consist of diverse people um, engaging with each other, then we have to encourage that engagement. Um, and it's not that you necessarily force everyone to get on with everyone and you force everybody to hang out, but there, there has to be um, a way for universities to better encourage um, better encourage interactions between different kinds of people. I think that's kind of um, so the key issue for me, I mean, coming at this from a sociological perspective and from the student from the student experience literature generally, um, I think that's kind of my take that if people would benefit from um, small group interaction, then you have to create more small group interaction. Now, the problem is, of course, that's potentially expensive in teaching terms. But one of the things that comes through a lot is that small group teaching, um, to a certain extent, dissolves those boundaries between staff and students because you're interacting closely with your students. And also if you have those groups being diverse, then you have people bouncing off each other and learning from each other and then making friends. So that's the way it works. In terms of a shared purpose in a way or a shared kind of outcome, um, I guess, again, you can't force it, but if, if we want to encourage universities as, as diverse places where people do learn from each other pedagogically and socially, then um, I think we need to encourage it in various different ways and look at um, look at things that aren't working. And part of the barriers comes from from the domestic students themselves, who see kind of um, a lot of them had kind of little interest or little knowledge, or just as, just assume that the Chinese students didn't want to talk to them. You know, and so there's there's that. It's it's trying to find ways of not forcing interaction but encouraging interaction for people who want it. I guess is kind of my take home point. Mm. Um, next uh, question from Lisa Lucas. Lisa, you'll have to unmute. Unmute, can Lisa. Me. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Can't believe I'm still adjusting to home working. Hi, everyone. <laughs> no, we all do this um, all of <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, really, really interesting. And as I said in my comments, um, I'm really fascinated about the, the, the issue of space and the dimensions. Um, and, and questions around architecture as well. And I'm going to send you an article. I don't know if you've come across 
um, by Professor Vong, who was utilizing Foucault and um, a critical space perspective um, in looking at campuses in Macau, which was is absolutely fascinating and I think might be useful. Um, yeah. But my question, so I think, you know, the theory question that you had is interesting, but I think also the methodological one. So you're talking about ethnography, but I was also just wondering about you know, where to go beyond interviews and focus groups, not that they are not important, obviously. Um, and one other part of the question that I had, which I didn't put there as well, was you seem to be quite focused on comparisons between different universities, which of course is interesting. Um, but also what about comparisons from within universities? I think that's also a fascinating question about the kind of microcultures within schools and departments. And I just wondered if that was another way to, to sort of take it forward. Yeah, no, that, um, yeah, the question of methodology is a really, really good one. Um, and one of the, I mean, there's a real, um, I mean, there's a, first of all, there's an irony now that I'm thinking very deeply about university campuses for the f first time in, in centuries where university campuses aren't functioning, at least in the way that they're kind of designed. I mean, it's obviously a really weird time, but yeah, I think there are there are much better ways of getting a sense of how students feel about their campuses than if you can traverse those campuses. I mean, what was nice is where I did a lot of the interviews um, were in these rooms where you had a view of lots of different university buildings. They were kind of quite high up. And so students could look out of the window and see lots of different kinds of architecture. They could kind of see the campus. Um, so imagine, let's say, um, if, if I was in Bristol and we were able to look um, from somewhere high up and look out across the campus, this kind of helped it. But yeah, when the notion of walking interviews and then also thinking about kind of journal entries and students mm -hmm. taking photos, um, I mean, as Simon kind of um, implied, I mean, this is, I mean, as you know, having been my PhD supervisor, this is kind of an extension beyond my PhD, um, try, trying to think about what the next kind of sets of questions are. And this was very much a pilot to try and think about how we can take this further. And methodologically, I mean, interviews and focus groups are kind of old hat in a way. Um, yes, they are really useful, but I think if we want to understand place and space, there are much better ways of doing it. Um, mm. And I did use vignettes, I gave them campus maps and those kinds of things. Mm. Mm. And that really helped. Um, in terms of differences within universities, that's also, I mean, that's a really, really good question. You kind of, you did definitely get a sense that there were some departments that were very geared towards their students or some staff within certain departments, departments that were very geared towards their students. But if you work in another department where they've massively over-recruited, and so you have enormous staff workload issues, there's only so much time you can give to students. And the students recognize that. They said, look, you know, it's clear that they've over-recruited to this, to this course um, because you know, we're having to, you know, we're split between two lecture theaters and there are only four academics teaching the course. Um, and it's clearly about bums on seats and money, but it's, this doesn't help the staff. So they recognize that tension too. So yeah, no, that variation within universities was something that kind of came out, but because I didn't necessarily have that many different students from that many different departments, the kind of where I could corroborate their stories and recognize those clusters. Mm -hmm. um, but that's interesting because it comes back to the building thing. You know, if you do education at, at Bristol, of course, you're in a building which is all kind of off campus, right? And so you have those, you don't necessarily have those, um, those shared spaces with other students. Yeah, if I could just say something very briefly, Simon. Um, yeah, I think that's fascinating. And it goes back to some of the questions I think that in the article that Professor Vaughan raises about, you know, if you look at the campuses and, you know, the kind of symbolic status that some of the um, buildings might have. But I think what might be interesting methodologically, if it's possible, is also to look, you know, even just at the near history of how that has been changing and transforming. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because just for example, at the University of Bristol, not to say that we get a lot of things right necessarily, um, but Senate House, which was the main building with all the wonderful views over Bristol um, and where all of you know the vice chancellor, senior management team were all housed, has recently been turned over to teaching wow. accommodation. So I taught there last year when you were still allowed on campus and I was just struck by the fantastic views from that building and it was a wonderful space to teach in. And that really says something then about the message of what goes um, to students about, you know, what's important within the university. So anyway, I'll shut up now, but I just think... Yeah, no, buildings right. and no, 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 Richard, I do have some more questions. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, you can't have a supervision meeting here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, look, we are running out of time, to be honest, but um, 
uh, Doria Abdal has asked me to ask something on her behalf because she's lost her voice. And we had Zach Spire and Claire Callender on the list as well. We may not get to both of them. Let me try for Doria first. Um, Doria wants to know of the inevitable question, Richard, um, how we make this richness, this variety of ex potential experience available to students during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, how can we help them to, as she puts it, feel the higher education space when most of their interaction is online? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really interesting question. One of the things that I could have flagged earlier on is that, I mean, even before this situation, a lot more of university activity has happened online. And, you know, a lot of student engagement happens kind of in their own study rooms and those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, people like Mark Carrigan and Kyumi as well, um, who, you, who asked a question earlier, I mean, they're much more proficient in terms of understanding virtual worlds and how they work in terms of the functioning of the university. One of the things that we talked about at the very beginning, even before this started, was the fact that um, the virtual does open up new kind of um, new kind of opportunities, but you don't get that immediacy in the same way. You know, the fact that we can have um, however many there are, 45 people here, um, is in itself a sign that the technology does something that that buildings can't, but also buildings do something that the technology can't. Um, exactly. Yeah, super good question. I mean, I'd really like to have been continuing this study kind of now to look at how the bubble thing works um, in a sense, but um, yeah. But you're right, you know, we can bring in Doria to a discussion in a way we couldn't have done in a face-to-face -face environment. I mean, Absolutely. you know, she's in Malaysia, she's and she's regularly involved in these discussions now. We wouldn't have had that relationship yeah. without a, a Zoom-based uh, environment. Um, very quickly, Zach, uh, you get the last question. Make it short, give Richard a chance to reply because it's his last statement and then we'll have to close the webinar. Hello, Zach. Sorry, good morning. Um, yeah, Richard, thanks for this. This was amazing. Uh, just a quick question about your point on co-location, not catalyzing or driving students' engagement with each other and their specific group or more generally between groups. I wondered um, if you had maybe a concluding thought on what we could do or questions we could ask to um, approach that, the tension you found in that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think the term that I would apply to this, one of the things that kind of stood out for me is that the student, is, is if you think about the student footprint um, in the terms of if, if you, um, let's say use GPS trackers and you looked at which students go where and there were some students who essentially had all of their classes in a single building um, which was access only to students in that discipline and then they maybe went to the student union where they hung out with their friends and then you had other students who um, who had classes all over the campus and so their footprints are entirely different and some of the work around flows and synaptic flows or syntactic flows from architecture shows that um, you can plot the lines of where people do and don't move together. And maybe it's asking universities, you know, a bit too much to think about where and how they channel people. But at, the, at Lancaster, for example, we have this relatively new spine that runs down the university and it's a bit dark and it's a bit gloomy, but it, in a sense, or you go to Bath and there are spaces where all students congregate at certain times between classes. And so thinking about how that works is a really interesting question. Um, but yeah, thinking about the student footprint and where those footprints do and don't overlap is a really, it's one of the, one of the things I want to think about beyond that. So thanks for that question. Um, I want to thank you, Richard. I thought that was a really interesting sem a seminar or webinar and, you know, one of the best we've had in, in terms of content and, you know, it just opened up so many things and didn't try and close them. And I thought that was a really useful uh, way to proceed. So Thank you for your uh, your intellectual approach to this, uh, you know, which was enriching. Um, and we hope we'll have you back uh, later on as you pursue more uh, inquiry. Um, thank you, colleagues. Thank you, everyone who joined the dis discussion. I apologise to Claire because I think we have run out of time for your question, um, but you'll be back hopefully next week. Um, and I hope sharing Tuesday's sem uh, webinar, which is. Uh, one where I present and have to step away from the um, from the from the chair, and that will be on um, dynamism and power in global science, an overview of uh, 
relations of power in the global science system, which of course is changing rapidly as we speak. Um, so thank you all for taking part and uh, we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday and next Thursday. Great, yeah, thank you. Thanks Richard. Bye for now.